Welcome to the Solution Nation podcast. My name is Sean Snowday, and I'm the president of Solution Nation. Solution Nation is dedicated to providing a platform for investors to learn about Israel's most dynamic public and private companies. We interview lead venture capitalists, Wall Street analysts, investment bankers, and managers of incubators and accelerators. Today's guest is Ben Weiss, and our topic is the Israel-Korea innovation ecosystem. Now, Israel and Korea have a great deal in common. Both countries received their independence in 1948, have tensions along their borders, have compulsory military service, and look after their diasporas. Israel is the largest consumer of Korean automobiles on a per capita basis, and Israel looks to Korea as a testing ground for its newest innovations. Please remember that all content provided on the Solution Nation podcast and website is for educational purposes only. Nothing shall be construed as investment advice. Investment decisions shall not be made based on information, written, verbal, or otherwise, posted or spoken on Solution Nation. Conduct your own research or consult with your own investment advisors before making investment decisions. So here's my good friend, the host of the show, and the CEO of Solution Nation, David Wanatik. Hello, everyone. My name is David Wanatik. I'm the CEO of Solution Nation. I'd like to thank you for joining us for this podcast. The focus of this podcast is the Israel-Korea Innovation Ecosystem. Speaking on this issue, I'm very pleased to introduce our guest, Ben Weiss. Uh, ben Weiss is a venture partner with SoftBank Venture Asia and a managing general partner at CE Ventures. Uh, ben Weiss is also the chairman at Alicorn, as well as a director at Glassbox and Plyops. Uh, ben is uh, from uh, New Zealand originally, uh, spent uh, some of his formative years in Australia, was educated in Australia, and uh, has a great deal of experience uh, conducting business in Israel and in Asia. So, Ben, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you, David. So I gave you a, a very a brief uh, background, very brief bio. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about your background and how you came to be interested in doing business and investing in Asia. Sure, with, with pleasure. Uh, so uh, as you mentioned, I grew up in, in the Asia Pacific uh, region uh, and um, I always had a keen interest to uh, explore um, that geography uh, further. So once I graduated, um, out of university in finance and law, I uh, moved to Hong Kong. That was uh, probably about 20 years ago now. Um, and I then spent uh, about eight years living in Asia, uh, initially in Hong Kong and following that in Japan and later on uh, for a short period in Singapore as well. So um, during that period, I was able to obviously work and travel extensively through the region, uh, spend time as well along the way in Korea, um, but got to know um, the group SoftBank uh, very well during my time uh, living in Japan. Okay, great. So now we can talk a little bit about uh, Korea um, and the connection with Israel. Uh, maybe first of all, um, can you say anything about the Jewish community in Korea? I imagine it's almost all expats. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. I, uh, when I lived in Japan, I was a regular at, uh, at the local synagogue, um, but uh, there's, uh, I think, a significantly lower community than in Korea. So um, there is a presence, there's a, you know, a Chabad presence, um, but as you said, it's primarily um, made up of expats uh, and obviously some um, Korean individuals that have married into the religion. Um, but predominantly, um, you know, U.S.-based uh, individuals, given, you know, the strong cooperation between uh, those two countries. Okay. And are there any Koreans in Israel other than tourists or business people or diplomats? Yeah, there's, there's a few uh, um, people I've met along the way. So um, uh, some of the venture funds, for example, Samsung, they, um, they have a local person that works uh, on the ground here. Um, there's also a, a Korean economic uh, sort of attache, a lady that, that had married a, an Israeli man and she'd moved to Israel and she does work uh, for the Korean government from here and obviously some embassy officials, but uh, they're few and far between, I must say. Okay. 
maybe we can talk about some similarities in the history between uh, Israel and Korea. So uh, my understanding, they both uh, received their independence in uh, 1948, just a few uh, months apart. Um, they have some tensions on their borders, or at least uh, in Korea on one of their borders. There's some tensions uh, as compulsory military services in, in, in both countries. Uh, anything else you'd like to tell us about that? Yeah, sure. So uh, that is quite ironic that they both share the uh, the same year of uh, independence. Um, in fact, um, uh, back in 1950, when the Korean War um, took place, um, David Ben Gurion, on behalf of Israel, was very quick to uh, uh, take the view that that South Af South Korea obviously um, needed the support, and um, while he couldn't get Israeli military and troops over there due to some conflicts in the uh, Israeli government at the time, they were actually providing um, aid, so funding to help the South Korean efforts uh, since 1950. So um, there has been a, a diplomatic relationship uh, all the way back to 1948. Um, as you say, they do share hostile neighbors and um, both countries need sort of the early warning detection systems that Israel's you know, develop obviously very well through Iron Dome in collaboration with the US government. And given obviously South Korea is a close ally of the US, there's uh, quite a bit of technology, radar technology, et cetera, uh, that is uh, useful for both countries. Um, what's also interesting for both countries is um, they both have uh, very little natural resources. I mean, more recently, in the last 10 years or so, Israel has been fortunate with some of the gas discoveries, but for a large part of their, um, you know, formative years as countries, they were forced to, uh, to use their human capital uh, to accelerate their economy. So there's uh, a lot of similarities there between the two countries. I would say that there are some significant uh, differences, for example, um, the risk uh, appetite or risk culture in Korea is obviously much more conservative than Israel, where entrepreneurs are a, um, a dime a dozen here. Um, equally, it's a country made up of very large corporates, uh, um, uh, sort of mega multinationals that dominate industries, whereas Israel's largely small to medium enterprises. Um, but they both uh, uh, collaborate very well in a number of fronts, uh, ranging from you know, economy and military all the way down to healthcare. Mm -hmm. Just a point of clarification, you mentioned something that I wasn't aware of. So uh, Israel's support for uh, South Korean independence, was the support um, financial or military aid or diplomatic? It, it ended up being purely financial aid from what I um, understood, um, but there was an interest um, to do something further, but uh, it was obviously controversial at the time to do that. So um, uh, from what I'm understanding, it was limited to some uh, economic monetary aid. Okay. And then you mentioned that South Korea doesn't have much in the way of natural resources. Does that mean that diplomatically, there may be a tendency in Korea not to favor Israel uh, too much and to, to align itself with more of the oil producing countries? Or Yeah, I mean, we, we can think back to the period of the uh, embargo. Um, and uh, during that period, Israel and Korea didn't have very close uh, diplomatic ties. Obviously, they needed, uh, well, they had to pick a side. Um, not every country did, but in the case of Asia, most of the large Korean companies um, boycotted uh, Israel and um, chose to you know, sell their exports to the um, the other countries in the Middle East. So there was that tension for probably around 10 years at that time. And then later on, the embassy and officials returned uh, and diplomatic relations returned as normal, but they were very much caught up in that tug of war. Mm -hmm. But uh, today, do you not see that issue? Do you not see uh, Korea being as dependent on oil or... Um, how have things changed? Is Israel still more, I'm sorry, is Korea still more inclined to uh, side with the uh, Gulf states or the oil producing states versus Israel? Yeah, look, it's a good, a good uh, question. I think the, um, the 
sort of Israeli outreach to the Palestinians and the discussions around the two-state solution gave some cover for Korea to um, sort of re-engage with Israel, um, you know, during the period where the UN was playing an important role, et cetera. So that helped to recreate that diplomatic relationship. I mean, in the recent times, I would say the countries have become stronger despite the back, backdrop in the Middle East, which is not getting any easier for Israel and the Palestinian solution obviously isn't there. Um, lately, the cooperation between the countries has expanded to the point where they were sharing vaccines uh, during the pandemic. In fact, they were the only two countries to find a way to ship vaccines to one another that were close to expiry date in order to meet the needs of the citizens of both countries. Um, Korea was also the first um, Asian country to sign a free trade agreement with Israel. So I would say that the, there's major breakthroughs between the countries, despite what's going on in the Middle East and the lack of progress, which in the past had kept Korea from engaging too closely with Israel. Well, I suppose the Abraham Accords would have helped. Uh, Israel is becoming much uh, closer uh, to the Gulf uh, countries and even Saudi Arabia, maybe not officially, but, you know, we do hear anecdotal uh, stories that the relationships are better uh, between Israel and, and some of those Arab countries. So, yeah. And, and, you know, um, it's, a, it's a very valid point. Um, the Korean national airline, Korean Air, was actually the first Asian carrier to initiate uh, direct flights to Israel. That was back, I think, in 2008. Um, and they have quite a large uh, population of uh, Christians and Catholics that uh, are fascinated and grow up very interested in Israel. So they cater to that uh, tourist market as well. So um, that's something quite unique to, um, to Korea that other countries in Asia don't have. Uh, and I think that's um, a large part of why um, the relationship will always need to be strong. In fact, you know, growing up in, in Korea, I think the statistic is they sell more uh, Talmuds um, per capita there than anywhere else because a lot of the learnings, Jewish learnings, are instilled um, at an early stage um, through the schooling. Um, so that's quite an interesting uh, statistic to look up after this. Huh. Uh, Koreans may buy more Talmuds than any other country per capita. Okay. Um, and I didn't know that. Uh, so the vaccines, I, I did hear that um, Israel shipped uh, some vaccines. They, they first offered them to the Palestinians. The Palestinians declined them. And then Israel was looking for to do some good. And who would want them? And the Koreans took them. But I didn't know it was uh, bilateral. I didn't know that uh, Korea was also shipping vaccines to Israel. There, there, there's been, you know, cooperation um, between the countries, and I'm not sure exactly what went in, in either direction, but um, certainly it was a mutual uh, arrangement for both. It may have been some PPE and other things that came from Korea as a um, sort of quid pro quo, but uh, that shows you the how quickly a deal was done uh, between the two countries. Um, and it was very positively reported in the media in both countries. Right, right. Um, is there anything we need to talk about relative to the relationship between Israel and Korea vis-a-vis -vis China? Um, does it help Korea to become friendlier to Israel to receive technology from Israel versus being as dependent on China for technology or... Um, is Israel a source of leverage for Korea, at least technologically? It's a good question. I, um, I understood from uh, one of my colleagues here that, um, that Israel is the number one market for uh, Kia, for example. So um, uh, the market share of Kia in Israel is the highest in the world. Um, so... Israel is considered a very important market for um, automobiles and electronics, obviously a fraction of the size of, uh, of the Chinese market. Um, but nevertheless, it is an important and valuable market for companies like uh, Hyundai, Kia or Samsung that, uh, that ship globally. And I think that 
um, Korea um, is obviously, you know, dependent on the export economy uh, for its own uh, economic growth. And I think they do a good job of uh, um, maintaining very good relationships to the best they can with both uh, countries. They, they require both export markets to grow for the Korean economy to perform well. Yeah, so that's a good point about the cars. A lot of Korean cars are in Israel. I would imagine that uh, companies like Samsung and LG sell a lot of electronics, a lot of televisions, a lot of uh, household appliances uh, to Israel. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. Especially on the automotive front. Okay. Um, what else does Israel need from Korea uh, besides the heavy cars and home appliances and electronics, anything else that uh, Israel imports from Korea? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, if you look at um, the Bloomberg Innovation Index, um, from memory, is, uh, sorry, Korea has been number one. It's been the number one most innovative country in the world. Israel straddles between five and ten. But Korea has occupied that number one position. There's a huge investment from the government top down in R&D. In fact, you know, Israel's always claimed that one of the highest R&D uh, expenditures per capita, which is true, um, Korea is number one, and it's been number one for some time. So both countries invest heavily in, uh, in technology development. Um, Korea's, in fact, historically been one of the earliest adopters of new technology. So if you look back in time, you know, um, casual gaming, uh, social media, broadband internet is uh, so korea has the fastest broadband connectivity or internet connectivity speed in the world they're the most connected country um they've got lte the lte coverage is 100 percent. they were embracing 5g before anywhere else in the world so for israel korea represents a good testing ground for new technologies because culturally in korea uh, businesses and, and consumers are early adopters. Um, so, for example, we've hosted uh, Korean gaming companies in Israel to meet some of the local players here. And if you look at some of the largest gaming companies in the world, um, they're Korean. And that's because that industry, that economy began, you know, more than 20 years ago, um, you know, long before, you know, gaming companies out of Israel were, uh, you know, becoming relevant globally. And what kind of technologies does Korea need from Israel or, or, or want to embrace more? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, obviously, autom automotive-related technology. So Hyundai is quite active in Israel, both you know, doing investments and looking for cooperation and new technologies to, to bring back. Um, Samsung has, I think, four different investment entities in Israel, doing direct investment and again, looking for um, opportunities to collaborate between their various uh, business units. Um, so that, you know, in the area of consumer electronics and automotive, uh, that's major. You've got as well in the area of um, pharmaceutical and uh, medical device, there's some Korean um, VCs that are doing direct investments in Israel in those sectors. And again, helping with creating partnerships to bring those technologies into the local market. Korea actually has one of the lowest birth rates in the world. Um, it's also an aging population. In fact, the Wall Street Journal predicts Korea will be the first country to become extinct uh, based on the um, declining uh, um, birth rate. I think, I mean, it's not, not anytime soon. It's around uh, 2,700, but um, the birth rate has been below one uh, for, for quite some time. That's going to create a big issue for uh, employment, so um, future employment in, in factories, et cetera. So again, um, IoT, uh, industrial technologies that can automate manufacturing plants and um, ro robotic technologies. These are other areas that I see a lot of interest from the Korean market in Israel. Mm -hmm. Does Korea need uh, food technologies, um, uh, protein substitutes, uh, manufactured meat and so forth? Um, is Korea food sufficient or are there uh, challenges that they have? 
It's a good question. I haven't seen that um, emerge, that theme or that level of interest emerge as much as I've seen uh, the other industries I mentioned, you know, including, for example, military cooperation, where there's very close dialogue between groups like Elbert and, um, and the Korean defense companies. Um, but that's something that, that, that should be further explored. Obviously, Korea is a very large consumer market and there's an abundance of new technologies in food tech here in Israel. So uh, it's a good question, something for me to follow up after this. Okay. Um, and uh, is there collaboration on a more formal level? You talked about the companies and uh, Korean companies having investment arms in Israel. Are, are there government to government innovation programs or funding and at, at the universities? Uh, do you know if there's cooperation between the two countries? Yeah, there, there has been. In fact, there are bilateral um, funding programs between the two countries. That was something that was initiated, I think, more than 10 years ago. Um, there's also um, cooperation agreements with um, institutes like the Weizmann Institute. And again, there's um, high level interest from both governments in finding ways for Korean companies and Israeli companies to work together and develop or share and develop uh, new technologies. Um, so they're much more advanced, I would say, than uh, any of the other countries in Asia that I've come across. I think there's efforts to do something similar in places like Japan and, and China, um, but certainly Korea's taken the lead and the initiative in this regard. Okay. Uh, just back to the, the birth rate uh, issue. Um, so Israel has had a lot of success increasing fertility. It's a big uh, impetus of the government. The government is very focused on helping couples uh, get pregnant and have more children. Um, is, is there is there a interest in fertility treatment, feminine technologies in Korea? And uh, you can tell me if this is true or not, um, but I hear in Korea, they're, they're very supportive of pregnant women. Uh, parking lots have special uh, parking spaces for pregnant women or some stores have special express lanes, uh, checkout counters for pregnant women. Is that is that true? It, it wouldn't surprise me if it's true. It's not something that... Uh... I ever encountered personally, maybe because uh, I couldn't read the signs, but um, certainly the government is concerned about this issue and there are, you know, financial, economic benefits, you know, tax reductions um, for couples that, uh, that have uh, children um, or multiple children. I think the big issue Korea's got is um, the outlook, the future outlook, the, the mood of some of the younger people who are finding it difficult to, uh, to finance their own lifestyle and thereby, you know, being concerned about being responsible for bringing dependence into the world. So I think that's something that the government needs to address, uh, the mood and the confidence in the young people uh, to have children um, and offering financial incentive is only one part of it, but um, there needs to be a sort of cultural change within the country because, in fact, that whole region, if you look at Japan, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, that entire region, the cost of living is very high and the birth rates there are all sub one or, you know, straddling one. Um, so it's a regional problem rather than a career problem. Mm hmm. Uh, and just as far as like the industries, just one more point. I imagine there might be some interest in, in cosmetics and aesthetics. Uh, Korea is very, very focused on uh, skin care um, and they're very good. They have very good products. So Israelis may be interested in that. And there's some very good Israeli companies that um, are involved in cosmetology, aesthetics like uh, in mode and, and so on. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me in, uh, in Korea. It's quite the opposite of uh, the Western world. So there, you know, white is uh, is the color of beauty. In the Western world, we're trying to get darker all the time and getting uh, tanned. And um, so a uh, very uh, different market than the West. And certainly there are, you know, technologies that can cater to that market. And certainly they've got a very high spend in that area. 
Yeah, I hear that even uh, the men in the military in Korea, they bring cosmetics with them and they, they put on different cosmetics depending on how much time they'll spend in the sun and, and so forth. Um, but anyway, uh, maybe we can talk a little bit about doing business in Korea. Um, how is it to do business in Korea? What is the ability of um, executives in Korea to speak English, for example? Yeah, it's a very good question. I mean, my experience in Korea um, has been largely uh, sort of insulated through the, the connection of SoftBank. So the president or the founder and president and CEO of uh, SoftBank uh, Japan, uh, Masayoshi-san, he's ethnically Korean. So his parents were immigrants to Japan. Um, and uh, when Korea was uh, sort of emerging as a tech powerhouse in the late uh, 1990s and early 2000s, he decided to establish SoftBank Ventures Asia in Korea. So that investment arm, which is 100% owned by uh, SoftBank Japan, became the investment arm of, uh, of SoftBank, but headquartered in Korea. And that was a conscious decision, obviously, ethnically. Um, it was a way to contribute to the Korean economy. I'm sure that played a factor, but it was also a fertile ground for investments. Um, and so through that um, SoftBank connection, I've been able to access a number of um, Korean corporates. Um, I would say that most of them are like-minded. So the Korean corporates that are also investors and partners of SoftBank are groups like Naver. Naver is the largest search engine in Korea, uh, for example. So they're effectively the Google of Korea. The, the Google algorithms don't work as well in the Korean language. So a local solution was developed at, at Superior. And Nexon, for example, which is uh, one of the leading gaming companies in the world. So through the SoftBank network, I've got access to a lot of these corporates um, who are all like-minded about looking outside the Korean economy for new technologies that could aid their business. Uh, and so I've had the luxury of being connected to those um, forward-looking English-speaking members of these companies. I think if I was to go and knock on the door myself without uh, these warm introductions, warm and tailored introductions, I'd find a very diff difficult uh, culture to uh, embrace. And certainly a lot of patience is required um, in order to, to get the locals comfortable if they haven't done business, for example, in Israel, to get them comfortable to start doing business. Um, it does require a lot more patience there than in other countries that I found in, in the region. Probably Japan is on a par with uh, um, Korea, but certainly my experience working in China, they were much more ready to make decisions and to explore opportunities. In Korea, they generally start very, very conservative uh, and you need to build trust slowly. Mm -hmm. The executives that you interact with though, um, can they speak English well? Can you communicate with them well? Or do they typically have their assistants write up their emails and, and help them with? Yeah, so a lot of the, the colleagues that I met were from the business development departments. Um, and a lot of them were educated overseas, gone to college in the US or UK or Europe, and then returned to Korea. Uh, so I was, again, you know, fortunate to, to have them. And from time to time, you'd have others that would join meetings and they wouldn't speak very much, but later on you'd understand that they do uh, understand uh, English, but are not comfortable speaking uh, publicly. So generally the, the teams that you're talking to that look at the international market are the teams that have you know, had that foreign education or had learned uh, English uh, in some other way through you know, a parent from abroad, et cetera. Um, but there is a, a pocket of, um, of people within each of these organizations that I mentioned that are purely focused on out, you know, out of Korea that are, um, you know, speaking English well and sometimes other languages as well. Uh, about 20 years ago, I did a program for Samsung and uh, it was very, very hierarchical. Um, nobody would sit down until the, the leader sat down. He sat down first. He sat at the head of the table and uh, nobody asked a question. They looked at the leader to see if he had a question first before anybody else would ask a question. And when we took a picture, they made sure the leader was right next to me. 
Um, is it still that hierarchical or has it has it liberalized a little bit in, in those years? I, I would say there's a lot of that. In fact, um, I, uh, I was in a recent meeting there and I had to move uh, chairs because I, I sat in the seat that was facing the door. And generally that that's the seat that uh, that the locals would like to have so they can see who's coming and going from the room. So um, there are small nuances like that to the um, sort of the art of doing business in Korea, no doubt. Um, but if you're, you know, if you've broken the ice after many visits, um, you tend not to have to, to deal with those formalities. But certainly at the first opportunities meeting companies, there are those protocols that are important to follow. Mm -hmm. uh, are you required or business people more or less required to um, go out for drinks with their Korean uh, counterparts and that kind of thing? Or is there not so much pressure to do that now? There, there is. And I've had many a night uh, in, um, in Gangnam and other places uh, drinking socially. And that's where you tend to, uh, to get to know the guys and the girls. Um, you know, lots of Korean barbecue. So certainly um, after work culture, lunches as well are very important for for team building and team bonding um there was uh, one evening there's some i'm just trying to remember the name of the drink where they mix a uh, beer and whiskey and um and i struggled out of the train station not knowing which way to turn to find my hotel so uh they may be quiet and unassuming in you know by day but in the evening they can be very large drinkers mm -hmm. Um, when you first meet a Korean counterpart, are you expected to bring a gift? I do. I actually bring, you know, from uh, Ben Gurion Airport, I, I usually bring uh, uh, some, you know, local snacks um, and, uh, you know, you leave it and, and people are very happy to receive a gift from uh, the country of origin. That's a, a nice customary thing that also happened in Japan. Okay. Um, and then back to the socializing, I think, uh, Carly Fiorina, who was running, uh, I think it was Hewlett Packard. Um, I think she, she wrote about, uh, some business she did in, in, uh, South Korea. And she said that when she had to go out for drinks, um, she would tell the bartender just to give her water. She had, yeah. uh, instead of, uh, drinking, cause I understand the alcohol is very concentrated. It's very, it's a very it stiff drink. The, they the the shochu um it, it's tough it's tough on on the liver it's tough on the brain it's tough the next morning uh, uh i had the same issue living in japan i did actually that uh sake and water are pretty interchangeable so uh i um i did play that trick a few times uh, in japan fortunately the, the team in in korea that i work closely with aren't as big a drinkers as they were in japan so i didn't need to do that and I could hold my own in, in Korea, but certainly in Japan, uh, that was very tough. And I, uh, I, I can sympathize with some of the foreigners that come and just aren't used to that level of, uh, of liquor. Mm -hmm. And I think in uh, this book that I read from Carly Fiorina, I think she was talking about in some cases when you socialize, you're sort of paired up with... Um, with a with a, an escort, not in a in a romantic way, but uh, the, they help you and make sure you're drinking enough and eating enough and helping you order stuff like that. Is that, is that the case? I, I didn't, uh, I didn't have that uh, benefit. <laughs> no one ever offered that to me. Okay. Um, but there are a lot of, there are a lot of nuances. For example, there's, you know, ride hailing services that pick up only women with only female drivers. And, um, you know, the, the market understands the nuances of, dealing with, uh, you know, different demographics within the society and also helping foreigners to uh, feel more comfortable as well. So um, uh, they're very thoughtful about all of these things. Uh -huh. Anything you want to say about negotiating with Koreans? Uh, do they start very high prices, very radical demands, and then do they have a lot of negotiating sessions or is it more sort of a take it or leave it type negotiation? I, I would say it requires a hell of a lot of patience um, and handholding and building trust. Um, it's very different to negotiating 
for example, in, in China, where it's very important, you know, price is very important and feeling like, um, you know, you've won the negotiation is important. I don't think that that's as important in Korea, but certainly the trust building um, and, uh, and, 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 and patience is key here um, because there isn't a lot of familiarity between Israel and, um, and Korea. Well, not enough familiarity. There's obviously much more. You know, obviously, the US has, has an army base there for some time and um, a lot of Koreans have, have lived and studied and worked in, in the US. So there's much more familiarity with that culture. But I would say for Israelis doing business there, um, it's important not to be too pushy or aggressive or, or salesy. Um, you know, one of the things that comes up, I, I must admit, in Israel, it's very similar in the US, when companies, entrepreneurs are giving projections, they're giving aspirational targets. And um, in Asia, it's a bit different. In Asia, they'll generally give projections that are achievable. And um, as a result, when we do our um, quarterly updates for, for my fund, um, it, it comes up quite often that... Uh, the entrepreneurs here can't be believed. Um, in Asia, if you don't hit your targets, there's much more shame, you know, for or embarrassment. So they they they, they tend not to overpromise or set those um, high level aspirational targets that they'll do in Israel. And so there was a feeling that they were being oversold, for example, by the entrepreneurs here and in the US. So I had to explain that culturally it's very different. Like when entrepreneurs are presenting here, people know that these are targets that are unlikely to be met. Um, but in Asia, generally, they expect if you're going to put some targets on paper, um, these are targets that are realistic. So there's those type of nuances that come up um, from time to time, and they need to be explained away um, to, to the locals in Korea. So that's something, again, that's very important um, when you're doing business Obviously, um, being accurate and presenting things as they are is an important part of building and, and re retaining trust. That's a very good point. I didn't know that. Um, so I understand when you're negotiating with uh, people from large Korean companies, it's sort of important to maintain your position and not to make concessions because they have to run the proposal up the flagpole and there might be 10 layers and if, if you get whittled down, if you make concessions 10 times, um, you're not going to like your deal. So uh, would you agree with that? Or uh, I, I do. And I think the, the hierarchy is not something that's always known in advance. Um, you're never quite sure who the ultimate decision maker is. And so I do, do think that's very good advice um, along the way um, because uh, – there is a period of time that elapsed from when you first talked to, uh, you know, your your colleagues over there about doing a deal before it's actually concluded, and uh, it's a moving feast along the way. So uh, it's good to be assertive, uh, and obviously be uh, be extremely patient along the way. I would imagine once you have a contract, the contract is pretty well written and pretty enforceable, uh, right? Uh, is that true or? Um do, do contracts not mean it's the final word in Korea? I think there's a lot of um, ethical understanding about or appreciation of, of, of agreements, of shaking hands and honoring your word. That's very important um, from my experience working in, in Korea. Um, and, um, you know, there's been situations where um, you know, obligations were made in companies that weren't performing well and, um, and the Korean corporates, you know, would keep their commitment to invest. Um, it may be different in other markets um, where there's legitimate reasons to withdraw from a transaction. Um, market conditions change, force majeure, whatever it may be. But certainly my feeling is that they respect uh, um, agreements once they're made and certainly as well, uh, their word. Um, I mean, that's the the peer group that I've maintained have all, um, you know, been those type of like-minded individuals. Do you think the Koreans want to become more like Israelis or Israelis more like Koreans in terms of um, 
entrepreneurialism versus empire building. Um, so do the Koreans look at Israel and say, they're, they're lean companies, small companies, they make decisions quickly, they're opportunistic, or, um, you know, some of the Israeli companies are getting pretty big too. And, you know, to get big, you need to put processes in place and redundancies and have layers of management and so forth. So do the two countries look at one another for inspiration? Koreans look at Israel to be more entrepreneurial, Israel looking at Koreans to, you know, to really scale up their, their companies to be worldwide companies. I think there's a huge thirst and appetite to learn about what makes Israel as successful a country as it is and how the ecosystem has evolved and developed into, you know, number one or number two in the world by sort of any metric. Um, having said that, it's difficult to, you know, turn around these large uh, ships um, that are, you know, built a certain way um, culturally within organizations. So, you know, SoftBank's a good test case here because, you um, Within the Korean market, SoftBank's probably the most aggressive VC investor having made investments all over the world. There aren't too many Korean VC funds that have that appetite or that, you know, that risk appetite, for example. Um, and for a long time, SoftBank was the envy even of most Japanese corporates because they had this swashbuckling, take no prisoner, um, bold, um, vision to dominate um, and to invest for the next 100 years. And it's a question now if, uh, if they still regard SoftBank in that light, because obviously the current market conditions make those, uh, some of those decisions look uh, erroneous or reckless. But, you know, time will tell, right? Um, cycles come and go. Um, over time, SoftBank's got more decisions right than wrong. Um, but there is an open question about whether that is the right way to do business or whether the tried and tested, play it safe approach, um, play it safe, thoughtful approach is the better way, the more measured approach um, of the past. Um, so I think the question will be, uh, you know, will SoftBank come out of this crisis looking as they were going into the crisis? And if they are, then it may be that other organizations in that part of the world will embrace that style of investment, innovation, and culture. Would, uh, would a well-to-do uh, family, parents, if, if their child dropped out of uh, one of the best schools in Korea to become an entrepreneur, um, would they would they embrace that and support the child, or would they think that's a terrible decision on the part of the? the, the it's a very good question. Um, and what you find is uh, a lot of families have uh, have one one child or, or two children at, at most, so that child becomes responsible for you know child or children become responsible for two parents and maybe grandparents, and so there is a big burden. On, on those, you know, young entrepreneurs or young graduates, um, when they're making sort of cavalier decisions like that, is it a responsible one, not for them, but also for the wider family network as their parents and grandparents age, and often the younger generation need to support. Uh, so in the West, it's less of an issue, the burden can be shared with other siblings. Um, but certainly in Korea, that plays a very important role in the minds of uh, the younger generation. Okay. Do, do employees at, at large companies, do they um, have uh, dormitories uh, in Korea or is that not the case? There, there are, yeah, there are um, organizations like Samsung that um, have factories, you know, in different parts of Korea. Um, and there are places uh, of... Uh, of stay for, um, you know, a place of accommodation for, for workers um, as well. So um, obviously Seoul's uh, quite expensive real estate for that, but certainly in other parts of Korea, the travel time can be immense sometimes. Um, so yeah, um, organizations offer those services to the employees. 
Mm -hmm. uh, second to last question. Last one's a very easy question. Uh, second to last question is, um, do, you, do you feel the tension with uh, North Korea um, when you're in South Korea? And uh, I, I believe I read that the South Korean government is moving much of its government uh, further south to this, maybe the second city, maybe it's uh, Busan. Um, you know, so maybe just talk about, you know, is it that people just get adjusted to to things that happen in North Korea or is, is, the, is the tension palpable? It's a good question. I visited the, the demilitarized zone. Um, it's an area that's forbidden for Koreans. Um, and um, they take this threat, you know, very seriously. When I say very seriously, it's a threat that's always been there. And obviously the men have been in the army for some period of time, each of them. And, um, you know, we in the West, um, you know, in some cases sort of laugh it off, right? There's been a movie made, as you remember, about um, the North Korean uh, dictator. And, uh, but for the locals, it is a very serious threat. And uh, from talking to them, they would love to find a solution, perhaps even more than the people in Israel would love to find a solution, you know, with their neighbors. Um, and so it's not a subject that you tend to, to joke about with them. Um, luckily, in the last you know, period of years, but since I've been there, it hasn't been palpable, um, the tension. But they know that that could change tomorrow, uh, depending on events in that part of the world. But I think that having the US government and support um, gives them a lot of confidence. And obviously, the technologies from Israel that they can purchase to give them early warning systems, et cetera, um, uh, you know, gives them more confidence to live there. I mean, the, the distance is, is not too different to the distance between living in Tel Aviv or living in, um, you know, and, and the distance to Gaza, for example. So it's a real threat, but it's not something that um, is taken lightly over there. They're, they're well aware of this issue. And of course, they'd love to find a solution. You know, they speak the same language. And they, they struggle to understand why the countries need to be divided like this. Mm -hmm. Another similarity with Israel is uh, my understanding is Korea looks after its diaspora and uh, you know, the people that can escape from North Korea, they take good care of, of those uh, refugees. And I believe uh, maybe some years ago, some Koreans that uh, lived in China for some years uh, went back to Korea and uh, took good care of, of that diaspora. Uh, if you want to say anything about that, that's fine. The last two questions are very easy. What's the time difference between Israel and South Korea? And how frequently are there flights between the two countries? Yeah, okay. Um, that's actually a good question. It's now either six or seven hours, uh, depending on uh, the time difference. Um, so this morning, before I had the call with you, I had uh, a call with Korea. So uh, I think today it's about six hour time difference. And up until the pandemic, uh, uh, there were three flights a week on Korean airlines. Um, so that was actually quite helpful. That was my um, airline of choice. Uh, and they stopped flying, um, obviously, because of the slowdown international travel. So hopefully that will resume again. Um, but traditionally, that was the easiest and, and fastest way to get there. It's about uh, 12, 13 hours direct flight. Um, and, uh, you know, every second or third day, you can catch a flight back. Okay. Um, this is fascinating. Are there any final comments you would like to make? Um, I'll just give you one example of uh, how different uh, Korea is to uh to some of the Western markets, um, there was an investment made in a um, automotive sensing company uh, by one of the Korean uh, corporates. And um, they had a very interesting use case for the technology. So this is a, a company that uh, uh, manufactures um, uh, radar, LIDAR solutions to help um, vehicles see in inclement weather and in low lighting and you know far distance etc and in most countries there's clear use cases for why um, that's needed for driver assistance uh, uh, etc but in the case of the korean market 
um, the technology was used for um, driverless vehicles that would be able to drive across the busy streets in Seoul and see how many uh, civilians were lining up outside restaurants or noodle bars and to alert um, workers in the office about optimal times to go down and get their lunch. Because obviously standing in line for half an hour to get a, a cup of noodles isn't the best use of your time. Uh, so that gives you an idea of how different um, the cultures uh, are in both markets. Um, and, um, but, but nevertheless, the, the, the common need for these type of technologies to solve real world problems, but also problems that are somewhat unique uh, to the Korean market, such as uh, the long lines uh, at the noodle bar. Very interesting. Well, this was a fascinating session. Uh, we really appreciate you spending the time to talk to us about the relationship and the cultures of Israel and South Korea. There's only a few people on this planet that can do that, and you're one of them, and you did a great job for us. So we really appreciate it. And we wish you a lot of continued success with uh, SoftBank and all of your other ventures. Lashana Tova. Lashana Tova. Thank you, David. Very kind. Okay, great. So.